Yeah, it's good. Okay. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Edwards and his staff continue to show me, and um, especially given my affiliation with an institution south of the Michigan State line, I really appreciate you guys being welcome. To, um, and I greatly appreciate this chance to share my work with you. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here today. This talk stems from my book manuscript about the New York-based American artist David Wojnarowicz, who lived from 1954 until 1992 when he died of AIDS. After an introduction, I will read various passages from the manuscript I'm working on that discuss both the hide-seek exhibition curated by the Smithsonian in late 2010, and the controversy erupting when the institution all of a sudden censored one work from the show, namely Wojnarowicz's A Fire in My Belly. And as I read, I will screen several versions of this 1986 to 87 unfinished work, um, an unfinished, quote, work in progress, end quote, which is how he referred to it, which began as Super 8 film and ended up video. My paper and the four versions that I'm hoping to show you today should take no more than 30 minutes or so. So after that, I'm hoping, um, I'm looking forward to opening things up to your questions and comments, and um, I look forward to the discussion. And meanwhile, I, I'm hoping you'll also take a look at the books and catalogs that I've brought in. Um, other than the copy of the award-winning Hide Seek catalog, most of the material I've brought is either about or by Wojnarowicz and includes that orange biography by Cynthia Carr that just came out this past July. And I meant to bring the cutting script for this film, the cutting or shooting script, but I forgot it, so forgive me for that. Um, otherwise, I'll, I would be showing you that. So I'm going to go ahead and start the films, and they'll run, hopefully, while I'm reading. That's your problem. I'm strongly considering the advice given by the father of my buddy, John Richardson, here at Wayne, where he's chair of the Department of Art and Art History. John's father suggests that I send my book, once it's out, with a thank you letter to the Congressional Speaker of the House, John Boehner, as well as to other individuals who not only proved instrumental in revivifying interest in the artist by the Western world, but also probably helped make this book project appealing to my publisher. During these last few weeks, there have been surges of violent, even deadly protest throughout the Eastern world against an ill-conceived, low-budget, anti-Islamic video production and YouTube trailer. Indeed, on September 11, 2012, crowds stormed the American embassy in Benghazi, Libya, precipitating the death of the American ambassador Chris Stevens and three members of his staff. Responding to these events, American commentators have taken pains to characterize our country as comparatively tolerant of artistic or even inartistic materials, even when such materials are perceived to be religiously offensive. For example, for an interview and piece entitled Held Dear in the U.S., free speech perplexing abroad, Noah Feldman, professor of international law at Harvard Law School, said the following. In the US, we value the liberty of the speaker much more highly than either the dignity of the person who feels insulted on the state's interest in trying to avoid violent protest. Sorry, it, who feels insulted or the state's interest in trying to avoid violent protest. What's most distinctive from our perspective is that we think that if your feelings are hurt, then that's your problem. We don't believe that you ought to be protected from the hurly-burly of political insult. That's a very deeply ingrained American notion. And because we're concerned not to allow what's called the heckler's veto, where the fact that one particular group or person will make a fuss means that we will prohibit the speech, we've tended to be extremely permissive, and that does make us very different from other countries. That was Noah Feldman. Or as Mitch Album recently pointed out in an editorial in the Detroit Free Press, we don't go killing people over acts of free speech. While groups may react strongly, Album suggests, 
quote, there is an understood line between protesting and committing such acts that are fundamentally against the very religion you are defending, end quote. Even New York Times op-ed contributor Nicholas Kristof asserted last weekend that, quote, conservative Christians did not riot on the Washington Mall, end quote, during the first American culture wars in reaction to government subsidized exhibitions featuring such works as Andres Serrano's Piss Christ. Bearing this enlightened and tolerant idealization of the country in mind, I would like to return now to the subject of David Wojnarowicz's A Fire in My Belly. A short version of this work in progress went on display in the Smithsonian Institution in late October 2010 before it came under attack by the French right who called it anti-Christian hate speech. Actually, you just saw it, that short version. And, and it also came under attack by members of Congress, for one of whom, Eric Cantor, it represented an obvious attempt to offend Christians during the Christmas season. On November 30, in response to an intense barrage of political bullying, coupled with threats to eliminate funding, the self-proclaimed world's largest museum complex suddenly folded sacrificing the less than four minute video to preserve hide seek difference in desire in American portraiture, its groundbreaking exhibition of 105 works. It's true, no one died as a direct result of the recent unfolding of the censorship controversy, which has come to be described as the second American culture wars. Indeed, even the first set of culture wars is understood to have produced no violent deaths, at least not in the sense associated with the last few weeks of overreaction to actual anti-Islamic sentiment. That is, not unless you count the more than 30 million total deaths resulting from the AIDS crisis, extreme intolerance, and clash of cultures. But perhaps Feldman, Album, and Christoph have a point in that despite concerted right-wing efforts to delimit homosexuality, in fact, the country continues steering away from such bigotry. Thus, in the wake of the Smithsonian censorship, rather than acquiesce to demands by the likes of John Boehner and Eric Cantor, hundreds of other academic institutions and arts organizations instead agreed to cultivate dialogue and debate by not only rescreening versions of the film, but also restaging Hide Seek. Throughout Washington, D.C. and New York City, moreover, hundreds marched against the Smithsonian, their protest placards reminding us that silence still equals death. Straight show about queer art. Despite critic Nathan Lee's cheeky assessment of Hide Seek, Difference in Desire in American Portraiture as a, quote, straight show about queer art, end quote, the effort to reconstruct a 120-year arc of American art is welcome and commendable. And I encourage you to look through that Hide Seek catalog before you leave today. It, it's a good catalog. The exhibition curated by Jonathan D. Katz and David C. Ward originated at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Although Wikipedia calls it the first major museum exploration of the impact of same-sex desire in the creation of modern American portraiture, they might have added since the late 20th century, or in an American museum, because there have been a number of other exhibitions. As Lee suggests, the straightness of Hyde Seek perhaps stems from too familiar a roster of artists. Combinations nevertheless proved refreshing and there were surprises. Over the past decade up until the show, Katz approached numerous venues with the exhibition proposal. But the Smithsonian, a funds-strapped government body and 166-year-old public trust, was the only institution agreeing to mount it. Hyde Seek was not scheduled to travel, but both the Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York and Tacoma Art Museum in Washington State voluntarily reorganized their schedules to accommodate its later showings. In May 2011, the project won a 2010 Award for Excellence from the Association of Art Museum Curators. In April 2012, it was a finalist for the first Alice Awards, thank you, Alice, Artistic Landmarks in Contemporary Experience in the category of Group Exhibition in a Museum. It later won first place from the International Association of Art Critics, United States Section, 
for Best Thematic Museum Show nationally. Significantly, awards announcements on behalf of the Smithsonian always neglected to mention that the cause of hide seeks extended run, if not popularity and success, revolved around its game, its own game of hide and seek with Wojnarowicz's A Fire in My Belly. Edited by Hyde Seek curators, A Fire in My Belly was converted from Super 8 film to video and spliced with an audio track recorded over two years later at an act up demonstration which the artist himself never linked to the film. It was also dramatically abbreviated to less than four minutes to meet institutional parameters on video length limitations. Notably, this final product showed no more than 10 discontinuous seconds of ants on a crucifix. Rather than shutter an entire exhibition, Smithsonian Secretary G. Wayne Clough sought instead to appease Congress and thus, quote, gifted to art history, end quote, Lee spiritedly persuades, quote, a splendid case study in cowardice, censorship, and institutional failure in that the Wojnarowicz affair performed the very premise and relevance of hide seek, end quote. Why target this object and or artist in the first place? Was this coincidence or were the individuals who applied pressure on Secretary Clough cognizant that Wojnarowicz had served as whipping boy during the first round of culture wars in 1989? And that he was one of the first artists to engage such pressures in the judicial arena, having become an iconic figure of queer protest? Was a fire in my belly requested by name? And if so, was it payback for the artist having won a federal case against the American Family Association and its founder, the Reverend Donald Wildman, in 1990? If the 1989 culture wars began on the heels of a waning Cold War, then the emergence of the AIDS crisis dramatically facilitated the shift in focus of political bellicosity from quote-unquote commies to quote-unquote fags. By quote-unquote twinning, as Katz puts it, AIDS with homosexuality, cultural warriors with right-wing agendas readily transferred to queers scathing attitudes otherwise reserved for those perceived as deserving of suffering and death due to, quote, wages of sin, end quote. 20 years later, in the 2010 to 2011 revival of the culture wars, what might such twinning tell us? Did the threat of contagion stem from the November 2010 Pentagon recommendation to end don't ask, don't tell, as critic Tyler Green has suggested? Had problems been simmering since at least 2003 when the US Supreme Court decided Lawrence versus Texas, overturning sodomy laws in the country? Was it the gradually broadening popular support for gay marriage in the years following the 1996 federal law denying recognition of such unions? That is, despite efforts in the subsequent 12 years on the part of a majority of states seemingly needing to redefine the parameters of marriage um, as between a man and woman, the courts kept overturning bans on same-sex marriage. Meanwhile, an increasing number of states were legalizing it, such that even the commander-in-chief, President Barack Obama, declared his support in May 2012. Was Hyde Seek itself so alarming? And how serious were the fears of anti-Christian feeling, given Wojnarowicz's so-called ants on Christ? Ancient and modern culture. Given the focus on portraiture and Hyde Seek, Curators defended original inclusion of the unfinished film as memorial testament to Wojnarowicz's best friend and former lover, photographer Peter Hujar, who died of AIDS on November 26, 1987. Yet Hujar was still alive when Wojnarowicz assembled the film in progress. Friends James Romberger, sorry, friend James Romberger, biographer Cynthia Carr, and others contend that A Fire in My Belly cannot be AIDS motivated since it was compiled before Hujar died and before Wojnarowicz himself received a positive diagnosis. By identifying the film as memorialization of Hujar's 1987 death, hide-seek curators signaled the AIDS crisis as had the anonymous Silence Equals Death campaign of crack and peel stickers 
which permeated the city that same year, pink triangles included. In an effort to underscore associations between AIDS and the video, curators superimposed the anachronistic audio track recorded years after the film when the artist marched with ECTA. To summarize a fire in my belly for a grant application, Wojnarowicz once described the project as, quote, based on travels through Mexico, end quote, and dealing, quote, with ancient and modern culture, there as well as the effects of modern religion and economics on ancient customs, end quote. He got the grant, by the way. The multivalence of any image or idea, such as ants on Christ, perhaps excuses Catholic League's Bill Donahue's mischaracterizations of an entire cinematic project as anti-Christian, quote-unquote, hate speech, even if based on such minuscule evidence. To complicate matters, however, in a first-hand account that critically contextualizes A Fire in My Belly, James Romberger emphasizes the artist's lifelong differences with the church. Clearly, Wojnarowicz chafed against those religious organizations denying his existence. The ants in question came from Mexico, Teotihuacan fire ants, and they appeared on screen for no more than 10 discontinuous seconds of the three minute, 37 second loop. For the month on view at the National Portrait Gallery, this meant that ants appeared no more than 4.6% of the time, 15 minutes a day for a month, or 465 minutes, that is, seven hours, 45 minutes total, not quite a work, a work day's worth of exposure, and not all at once. Before getting suppressed, moreover, the work was neither prominently displayed nor easy to locate. Granted, fire ant bites notoriously, um, cause notoriously painful burning, a sensation Wojnarowicz once described as, quote, a lit cigarette being placed against the skin for 10 minutes. Yet ants appear only intermittently in isolated glimpses and fleeting seconds, in contrast with recurrences of other Christian as well as Mesoamerican imagery. And Wojnarowicz filmed ants swarming more objects than a crucifix amidst syncretic mixtures of Catholic, Aztec, and Mayan artifacts, shrines, and ceremonies, including those dedicated to the National Day, Day of the Dead holiday. If, in the context of Day of the Dead ceremonies, borrowing practices and rituals from indigenous and Catholic traditions alike, then the ant documentation cannot be anti-Christian. The colorfully decorated sugar skulls, mon money, and other donations placed on the ground where ancestors and loved ones rest inevitably manifest in insect swarms. Yet rather than intrusive or insulting, much less degrading, the ants are fundamental to the process of devotion, enabling sacred ground to receive mortal gifts. In fact, ants recur throughout the artist's last six years of work with no problems of reception, unlike other Wojnarowicz imagery as that preoccupying the Reverend Wilder. So why do ants cause concern in November 2010? Why not challenge the full frontal human male nudity of not to mention other Christian imagery potentially under assault in a fire in my belly. For example, how did the detractors re recognize, as friend Romberger shows, the falsity of the Christ mask that burns as a result of fireworks and reappears in several paintings later, including Wojnarowicz's 1986 portrait of Bishop Landa, evoking the heinous obliteration by fire of indigenous cultures and religions in the name of Christianity by a 16th century Spanish priest. The Smithsonian censorship of A Fire in My Belly raises questions about what happened, who was censoring whom, and how to interpret an unfinished work, especially once it gets sacrificed to the politics of representation and gets subject to frequent misinterpretation, whether by ignorance, design, or desire to silence others and self. Silence still equals death. So far, there seem to be four extant versions of A Fire in My Belly, all four of which I'm showing you here. We started off with the newest version, the most recently edited Smithsonian video from 2010, the three minute, 37 second long version. And we'll finish with the likewise posthumous 
YouTube video posted in 2007, which was 4 minutes 11 seconds long. Both this fourth and third version of A Fire in My Belly were modified by someone other than the artist. At least, however, in the case of the third, the YouTube version, or the so-called YouTube version, which he himself edited in 1989, he was alive to sign off on the modifications. In 1986 to 87, he also produced version one, which is 13 minutes, two seconds long, and version two, seven minutes, 23 seconds, which are on the screen right now. This, this is version two. All four versions remain available on the internet, on Vimeo or YouTube. Switching back and forth between color and black and white, the self-proclaimed work in progress poses ethical and political dilemmas, all the while exploring humanity's aggressions. All versions conclude in apocalyptic conflagration, confirmed by the cutting script, which I wish I had to show you, but say it. In the longest first known version, the final scene depicts a map of Mexico burning. The subsequent versions close with the respective immolation of a Mexican doll with guns, the Christ mask that references Bishop Landa, a spinning eyeball, and a revolving globe of the earth. And actually, there's a painting he did later where the eyeball and earth are one and the same. So you might think about that when you see that part. After establishing location with a map of Mexico, the first version opens with a sequence of headlines from Mexico City's newspaper pages, exploding disasters in air and sea, um, suicide, police corruption, assassination, sacrilege, recurring sexual crimes, and violence. Interspersed between the lurid words and photos, initial footage also documents companies of horses, dogs, and cowboys driving cattle, kip goats, sheep, and pigs through city streets to slaughter. A rich montage follows. Mexican professional lucha libre wrestlers, occasional real street balls between spirited boys, captive roosters sacrificed for public cockfighting, bulls killed in live and televised bull rings, captive monkey, goat, and lions compelled to entertain humans under circus tent tops, and omnipresent law enforcement in the form of cops, guards, emergency vehicles, and armored trucks. Any dread of violence grows with every further incident of deadly public spectacle. The earliest version includes not only a title sequence, but also closing credits that anticipate the events of the second and subsequent versions. The final frames of the first version, for instance, thank friend and filmmaker Richard Kern for the very fireworks that will torch Bishop Londa, but not until this second, shorter version. So there are reasons to believe that that 13 minute and seven minute variations were conceived in combination, even if ultimately shortened through editing, to a four-minute version, an impression reinforced by the cutting script. Significantly, the posthumous 2010 Smithsonian three-minute version opens the same way as the seven-minute, with the turning gears and documentation of impoverished Mexicans. By contrast, the third four-minute version, which I'll show you next, which is on YouTube, Rather than start with footage of gears and the disabled, instead opens with several seconds of ants on the crucifix. Edited by Wojnarowicz for German director Rosa von Praunheim and friend Phil Zwickler's 1990 Silence Equals Death documentary, this version would ultimately go viral on YouTube, thus presenting a more obvious and accessible target by the fringe right than the fourth displaced version once on view at the Smithsonian. That said, friends of the artist, Romberger, Turner, Sir Rodney Sir, all considered that third silence equals death version as appropriated by directors Praunheim and Zwickler for their 1998's documentary, the closest to a final cut. Though, like the Smithsonian's even shorter 2010 edit, this third version was combined with new audio not selected by the artist, that supplanted any 1986 to 87 original soundtrack, which Tom Rauenberger, Turner, and Doug Bressler each recall um, having heard about. And the Fails Library, which is where these videos and the Super 8 film are housed, 
um, maintains that this first and second version are silent, as, as you saw in the credits, the opening credits. Alive during the making of Silence Equals Death, the documentary, Wojnarowicz presumably gave Brown, Praunheim and Zwickler permission to pair the third edit with This is the Law of the Plague, an audio track by avant-garde singer and composer Diamanda Galas. An early composition from her ongoing work, Plague Mass, it premiered at the Cathedral of St. John, the Divine, the same year as the film. Bass, drum, and chorus of male Gregorian-like voices join her operatic invocation from the Book of Leviticus on the unclean. An entity named Semiotext posthumously posted the four-minute video on YouTube in 2007, months after the 2006 um, Semiotext publication of interviews with Wojnarowicz and his friends. That's the white hardback book in the middle of the table. Um, Critically, this third version, rather than the fourth and tamer Smithsonian cut, was posted alongside original reports on the censorship controversy, for example, by the Washington Post, arguably inflaming antipathy and exacerbating public response toward a fire in my belly. As Galassa's emotional duress regarding AIDS confounds the false righteousness of Leviticus in discriminating against the diseased, so Wojnarowicz's tightest edit yet offers an elegiac journey through a decade of disaster heading toward planetary annihilation. So those are the passages that I um, felt I had time to read from the book manuscript. But I also want to turn the sound up so that you can at least hear um, the YouTube version as well as the Smithsonian version. So I'm going to start with the YouTube version. And let's see if the sound is up. Hopefully you'll hear a sound soon. And if not, Jennifer. Yes. Or maybe here. Oh, there it is.
And then if you want to see the um, <coughs> The Smithsonian, with its audio, it was really sounds like. running while I open it up to the table, but, um, and by the table I mean all of you. So, please, thank you for your attention, but um, please, any questions or comments? Did David or Diamanda collaborate at all while we were still alive? No, they never even met. And so it was a decision that the director made because he knew them both. Um, they they knew of each other, and I have no reason to believe David didn't respect Diamanda's work. She has commented about how much respect she had for his work. So, um, but they never had a chance to meet or collaborate. About the equivocation of the burning eyeball and the burning earth and, and that analogy and 
the ending and that, I mean, have you expanded on that or? I mean, I, I think he had a apocalyptic sense of things. So I, to me, that's, that's what it ultimately conveys. Um, I mean, he, he's, there are a number of works, like the, the one that's called um, Crash, The Birth of Language, The Invention of Lies. We can find it in one of those books, but it's a train basically hurtling into the earth and about to crash. But I think he thought of everything, all of civilization, hurtling toward this sort of end point because of the way that civilization or societies have developed, that we've kind of written the script for ourselves that we're in this headlong collision course. And so I think he's just reinforcing those ideas in part. So point it because about like a very vision. But the, the, yeah, especially at the very beginning, I think when you're when the camera is well, he's on, he's in a cab in some cases, he's on buses in some cases, and the camera is doing this sort of 360 loop. Mm -hmm. So that ro rotating eyeball mm -hmm. with the rotating globe does mm -hmm. it. It also does seem like a comment about vision, about the experience mm -hmm. of moving through the world. Mm -hmm. Plus, he has lots in his paintings where he deals with microscopic and telescopic imagery to uh, deal with like the, uh, the way that um, certain groups have been viewed or put in perspective um, within the gaze of uh, public uh, media, public presentations for religion. Yeah, the sex series is a good example of that, where you have the portals that both operate as the eyepieces of telescopes or microscopes or even peepholes viewing some um, secret kind of activity. But it's also surveillance and it's also the kind of arc of um, inattention and, and indifference to what was going on during the AIDS crisis. And all the violence and the cockfighting. And all yeah, that's another, uh, I mean, it, I think that's a theme that he was actually exploring in those middle years, that in a sense anticipates, but isn't even necessarily aware of the kinds of directions he's going to go when he turns his attention to the AIDS crisis full force. So he happened to be personally um, interested in and exploring how it is that society becomes so violent. Where all are these, what are the structures of society that perpetuate this kind of violence? He was thinking about his own family dysfunction in part, his own violent father, but he was also thinking about larger structures like, like prison, the way that someone goes to prison and then comes out an even more violent person being in some ways a consequence of the nature of prison and not that person. And so he, he had been writing a number of articles about this issue of violence, societal violence, psychological violence. And I think that's what he was essentially trying to work through when he went to Mexico. And so he was shooting these films documenting a variety of forms of violence. But what's really fascinating, because I really don't think he had AIDS forefront on his mind at that time, was how easily those same issues seemed to shift over to the domain of the AIDS crisis. And so um, one of the objects I brought, I don't know if where this, it's, it's, this is a CD, but, um, or, yeah, a CD, but it also it got turned into a DVD, and it was a multimedia production and collaboration he did with a composer named Ben Neal, where he actually took footage from A Fire in My Belly, edited it, and in fact, I think that's where the the shorter, shorter version, the four-minute version that ends up in Kraunheim's film, 
was actually first produced for Itzo Fomo. And in Itzo Fomo, he's talking about AIDS. So he marries that imagery with his preoccupations around AIDS later, in 89, 90, but not at the time that he shot this footage. I guess that goes to the point of how malleable these um, images are. In, in his mind, he would adapt them for different purposes. Is there a kind of an irony in that your, your work is, uh, because of the censorship, is there's the greater endorsement for the publishing of your book because it's like the, the, the censorship has further legitimized its, its uh, uh, you know, its inflammatory nature. So it's kind of like the, the censorship legitimized the original sense of shame and, yeah. and outrage, which in a, an interesting inversion gives you you more uh, credibility and authority in their eyes because you're more rough, more aligned with that shadowy group that's you know it's like 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 the it's kind of like legitimizing the the, 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 the tough city of you know those that deal with this tough tough shadow aspect of our culture and so it's a kind of a interesting twist, isn't yeah. it, that the yeah. censorship itself further legitimizes scholarship? Yeah. It's a really strange, yeah. bizarre yeah. thing. But it's also the things that get censored, or often get censored, end up being the things that have to emerge, that have to surface. So there's this, the, yes. the, yeah. this yeah. way in which there's a self-fulfilling mechanism in censorship. And I think Michel Foucault talks about that in his writings about how that censorship in, inevitably um, actually allows for an opening, too, in a way. Yeah, it's very ironic. I mean, I think that's why, I, I don't know what John Boehner would say, but I'm, I'm almost 75% serious about sending him a copy. Yeah. They, um, I think you should follow your hunches. And, and, and another, um, and a, the, the patriarch of the Lenzo family said, never deny a generous impulse. Put some poison. Do it, yeah. It's like the most, those, those, those moments are the ones that sometimes break through things that it's interesting, so I would follow your hunches, you know, you know follow those thoughts, do it. But the, I think that's the, maybe the remarkable part about that censorship that occurred in 2010 is how the rest of the art world seemed to react. I mean, nobody from any organization I can tell, including a commission that was specifically formed to study in it to an internal commission to study the Smithsonian decision, um, nobody seems to think G. Wayne Clough made the right decision. And he won't take it back. I mean, he never, he never acknowledged having made a mistake, and the video never went back on view at the Smithsonian. But there were multiple efforts by other institutions to counterbalance that um, bad judgment. And in the sense that it really ultimately perpetuated the film, it, it brought a lot more attention to the issue than they might have thought was possible, it, it backfired. So it's a similar kind of inversion. Mm -hmm. I, I think the other thing for me too that the um, whole incident raised was the appropriateness by which we look at an artist's work, um, especially an unfinished work. And, and Boynerovich was notorious for recycling, repurposing the materials that he would work with. So he, he, he would 
repeatedly return to images in one form and another. And I mean, he definitely scrapped this film out and reassembled it in a lot of different ways and, and incorporated the imagery into a variety of objects like paintings. But knowing that, even knowing that, I, I still don't understand how the curators of the Hide Seek show could do what they did to the video because that video really wasn't a finished product and that wasn't acknowledged to begin with. But then they compromised it in so many ways already long before the Smithsonian secretary censored it. So there was there were levels of censoring going on throughout. What does that script tell you that you can bring with you? Tell us about the, the, the film or the variations. Or One thing I think it tells you is that the imagery that shows up in version one and the imagery that shows up in version two are related mm -hmm. because you can see it switching back and forth between those two bodies of images in the script. Another interesting aspect of it to me personally is um, a structure that Wojnarowicz seemed to impose on a number of his works that involved a kind of cosmography, if you will, um, a sort of understanding of the whole world in terms of a particular kind of structure. And for him, that structure was devised from the four elements. So fire being the dominant element in this film, it was also counterbalanced with earth and water and air. And it seems like that four-part structure seemed to help him organize a number of other works as well, but I feel like that, um, again, it, it's pretty evident when you're looking at the script that he's dividing things up like that, but also it reinforces the notion that the first and second version of this film were really meant to be in some way linked, and that third edit he creates perhaps is a compression of that linkage. But that's not something he um, explained anywhere, so it, this is all guesswork. Um, I think another thing that Cutting Script tells you is just how fluid the ideas were to him, that just because he put it into this Super 8 film form format didn't mean that it was fixed. It was actually a very um, fungible kind of material to him. So. He could imagine re di disassembling and reassembling it or reconceiving of the underlying or overlying structure. Um, so you, you can see him changing his mind or crossing things out or linking things or dividing things up differently than he originally intended. Um, How lengthy is it? The script. cutting script. Yeah. It's it's about four feet long mm -hmm. and it's you can See the cut and paste it. marks. Yeah, you brought it. Didn't you? Yeah, I brought yeah, it to that last right. talk. That's right. Yeah, it's very yeah. interesting to look at. I'm really sorry that I didn't. Yeah, it's really it. interesting. But it's, um, I think it's a good source of information for this film because it it helps. It, it gives a sort of counterweight or a context for the film that wouldn't otherwise exist. So one thing that's interesting about the Hyde Seek show when it did travel to Brooklyn and then Tacoma was that they actually uh, put that they cutting did. script on view, wow. yeah. So they, they made an effort mm -hmm. afterward to contextualize this work, which I think is essential. But the, and that would not have necessarily taken place had the Smithsonian not censored the work, so. That should be a protocol to reinstate every show that's censored, you know? It should just be standard procedure. <laughs> standard operating procedure, you know? The original protest, you speculated, uh, you know, the uh, idea that there may have been some uh, memory of the first cultural war, um, and uh, who, who were the original protesters against um, who specifically targeted his work? 
There were a whole slew of them. So they were organized? No, were there... I don't know if they were organized, but I mean, it was, he was the third artist. And I never actually put that together until I was reading Cindy's book, um, the biography of Point Arovich, but... Um, I don't mean the first cultural wars, but the one in Washington. Oh, yeah. sorry, okay. But both are interesting. Well, I was going to say, he was the third artist targeted after Mabel Thorpe and Serrano um, by a number of people. So not, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about who spearheaded the protest yeah. in 2010. There was a gallery called Transformer, which was the first to say, we need to show this film. It's been censored. We're going to show it. And so they put it on view almost immediately. Like that, it, November 30th is when the decision occurred. And by that night, by midnight, they had a public screening on the street of this film. So they became instrumental in sort of spearheading a, a protest movement. And then um, some impromptu protests emerged almost immediately afterward that were staged both in front of the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, but also in New York. And that I think walked Fifth Avenue and ended up in front of the Metropolitan Museum. Who specifically did the museum respond to? I mean, the protest to take it down. Who was the museum reacting to? Yeah. Some of that is unclear. All we really know for sure is um, Bill Donahue was the first person to sort of publicly denounce it and call it hate speech. He's the director of this organization called the Catholic League. Um, he contacted, or he, his staff contacted members of Congress. So John Boehner and Eric Cantor. John Boehner wasn't yet Speaker of the House, but he was vying for that position, so it was kind of a political move on his part, and Eric Cantor was at that time minority whip, now he's majority leader, so he too was in a position to gain if he could build on that rhetoric. Those two were instrumental in contacting the Smithsonian, but there's I guess a little bit of murkiness about <coughs> who else might have been involved and who exactly, um, how the decision actually unfolded ne initially. Um, it wasn't the secretary of the Smithsonian that was behind it. I mean, he, he ultimately did make the decision, but he was pretending as if it was the director of the National Portrait Gallery, Martin Sullivan, who was making the decision, and Martin Sullivan was kind of thrown under the bus in that way. And then there were, there were counter reactions, like both Jonathan Katz, who was an unaffiliated curator, and David Ward, who was actually on staff with the Smithsonian, both protested this decision to remove this object. So there was, it, it's a little bit actually unclear how everything happened. And it took a few weeks before it became clear that it was the secretary who hadn't even seen the exhibition and who certainly hadn't seen this work, who had just decided, we'll take this video out. And initially, Boehner and Cantor and Donahue were not just simply targeting Boynarovich, but a number of other examples of work. Like um, if you open up the Hyde Seat catalog, you might spot Annie Leibovitz's photograph of Ellen DeGeneres, where Ellen DeGeneres is wearing a bra, but she has her hands cuffed below her breasts. That was an image that was apparently driving Congress mad. <laughs> and that was one that they were they weren't <laughs> censored. There were some others that um, just had them upset, but but this particular object turned out to be enough to appease them. So as soon as this object was removed, they stopped worrying about it. I think about a week or two later, Gabrielle Giffords got shot, and so their attention shifted. I mean, John Boehner was actually quite gracious at that point and said some of the nicest things he's ever said about a Democrat at that moment. Mm -hmm. And so the, the attention shifted and, and turned in a different direction altogether. But the protests kept going. And then people started staging um, symposia and a variety of venues where more information could be shared about Buena Roma, which is what motivated the work to begin with. Organizations, how mobilized are the organizations that were so fierce against the culture wars 
like just two decades ago, a decade ago, they still, like I just got my anti-censorship, you know, packet, you know, for, are they still as there? I mean, I mean, they really were needed. They were formed because they were needed for artists. So all those organizations, um, the Coalition Against Censorship, um, those, those um, organizations to protect artists were forged for that reason. And I'm still getting mailings, and they're still, I'm just wondering if they've grown, if they're still, uh, as, have they grown more? Are they still, a, um, have they made a shift? Have they, are they still standing strong? Are they really supportive in, in, this, in this situation? Where they? I, I, I guess I feel mixed about it. <coughs> I, there was a, a great deal of popular support or protest that clearly showed a mistake had been made. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I, mean, I think that's part of what I was trying to tease out at the beginning with the way commentators have been reacting to the anti-Islamic video and how people are reacting to that. And, and the way that they want to spin or characterize this country as being incredibly permissive. That sense of permissiveness did not come across. I mean, I, not in the media, not, there were a few people who made comments, but for the most part, nobody was really stepping up and insisting, this is foolish, why are you guys doing this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so, right. Except Obama's UN speech recently. No, I, yes, yeah. but I mean two years right. ago right. when right. the Smithsonian made this crazy decision um, and when Congress right. just right. sort right. of overreacted, right. nobody right. was... Okay, okay, so they didn't Checking have, them. Okay, 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 right, right. They didn't, they didn't speak to the power. No. They didn't speak to the no. source. I don't think so. Right. And I think, right. I think You're not that a clear it, enough spokesperson. No. Yeah, I mean, I think it was mostly a sort of popular mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. level of protest mm -hmm. and not, I mean, there, there was an organization called People for the American Way that came out with a brochure a few months later that was quite explicit about saying the Smithsonian was caving into political bullying, period. Mm -hmm. And in the future, here are some smarter ways of approaching this kind of protest. But it was pretty retrospective, and it didn't change the decision of the institution. Well, that's interesting to like, keep, keep them challenged about what their role is and what they could be doing. So that's an interesting idea, just like what People are saying about AARP isn't radical enough. They're not. Mm -hmm. They're not like forceful enough about defending. Or AAUP. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. No both. Or, or both. Yeah, right, right, right. Or, or yeah, right about the challenges for ten against tenure. tenure yeah. Like it's outrageous. Like we should be on the streets. And so yeah. So they're not. These organizations don't have enough of a pointed voice. They or seem to have that skill or that. So that's a good. That's a really good. You know, it's needed, and they're not big. So who is that? It should be us. I guess that should be us. I don't know. Who I don't know. Be. Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I guess ultimately what I find so admirable about this particular artist is how he would jump into the fray mm -hmm. and, and lead a protest, mm -hmm. start a protest, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. speak truth to power mm -hmm. in some pretty courageous ways. But in, it, I mean, I think you don't really get the full extent of how, of what he was going through while he was doing all this, until you read that biography, where she, I mean, the last several years of his life, the apartment he was living in, which he had inherited from Peter Hujar, who he had taken care of before Hujar died, um, the landlords repeatedly tried to drive David out, and partly because he had AIDS. So part of it was just driven by this, this the fear, fear, probably, yeah, and yes, the fear. stigmatization of the diseased. And, and they made him sign this contract that said that if there were ever a cure for AIDS, he would leave the apartment in a month. Or if he died, he could never turn it over to another friend of his who had AIDS. So there were, there were all these different you know, points they got him to concede. But then, the entire several years of his life, there were constant problems with the apartment too. Leaks in the roof, water coming down, flooding going on in his studio space, and 
and him having to deal with just having a, a physical shelter that was inhabitable and healthy at the same time that he was grappling with being censored by a number of organizations and trying to make work, you know. With that, with that what, what was his income? I mean, what, how did he, it's just, how did he, I mean, his income was based on being a living artist, so mm -hmm. it, yeah. it came and went. Yeah. And he was reliant on Medicaid for his health costs in the last few years of his life. And after he died, the city of New York turned around and sued the estate to recover those Medicaid oh. costs for something like $100,000. He, he was indigent, indigent. I think he had started to see success in his life, especially in some of the middle to late years, but he was also very generous with his money, so he would give it away to other poor artists. And and he traveled a lot, so that, I mean, I think that was, that probably also affected how much he had, but I don't, he was a person that probably um, wasn't very smart about money to begin with, hadn't learned how to have a savings account or a checking account or anything like that, so mm -hmm. it probably wasn't gonna, I mean, it probably would have taken a while for him to become comfortable with even having making enough to live. Yeah, it's usually not a concern that we get involved with until later in our lives. Right. So our most sort of affordable family that has that in your bones, from what I've seen of artists, right? And maybe that's why he was constantly recycling materials to begin with. I'm not wildly familiar with any of his work other than what I view today, but I find it very interesting the amount, the, the amount of visual consume, it, it, everything is a visual consumption of some sort, whether it's by the viewer or visually you're watching the consumption occur in front of you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, my husband unfortunately has been watching way too much CNBC recently, <laughs> and I've heard so much about how capital lot is. Capitalism is the only fair and good and blah, 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 all this other stuff. But, um, but, you know, I, I think, of, you know, and it's because of what's going on in my head right now, I guess that I'm seeing this, but this relationship of consumerism and, you know, the capitalism tends to fall more on, on a Republican side of the aisle mm -hmm. and, and that um, this is really making it quite a, quite a huge and impactful statement about things and people and the victimization and mm -hmm. consumption of, of, <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that I couldn't, that's where I was making this connection with his work and then when you started talking, you know, the, the whole Boehner thing and, and all of that, I just think it's a really interesting, you know, that they would be the ones, of course, you know, and, 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 but they would, maybe even turn it as, you know, a, a fight against AIDS or whatever yeah. there yeah. was. There was a lot of material covered yeah. in here. It it's, wasn't just about AIDS no. or it wasn't just about Christ. one thing or another or yeah. another. There's a lot going on. Yeah. But I love how, you know, from just a little that I know of it right now that, that you know, it sounds like, you know, they, they turned it into whatever the hot topic was of the moment. Yeah. It's amazing. It, I think the first culture wars when one of the points that he got targeted for involved basically a brochure created by Donald Wildman and the American Family Association that ultimately ended up being a mechanism for raising money. And they raised millions of dollars. And so it, it definitely makes you wonder, is it that they're so concerned with these issues, or are they looking for ways to right. make money? Right. Because it, there is this definite um, advantage of triggering response right. with a few. You know, arts, art can be interpreted in any way you want when you view it. And here's how we interpret it. And I know you're going to give me money because you agree with my, my interpretation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the ants themselves 
just is this sort of tell mm -hmm. on the part of the re overreaction because the ants themselves are not in any way actually degrading or mm -hmm. denigrating Christ. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, it's it's a crucifix. It's not Christ. It's ants mm -hmm. on this crucifix. Mm -hmm. But it's in the context of mm -hmm. a very very natural. Mm -hmm. um, I've lost the word, but I mean, in the in Day of the Dead shrines, you 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 put all kinds of things down, including food, so ants are bound to be attractive. Mm -hmm. So, if that was the issue, it just seemed like they couldn't have been looking very closely because that was clearly not what was going on. There were other things that maybe could arguably be mm -hmm. more denigrating that never even came up. And so, just reinforced the common um, observation that most of these sensors don't actually look at what it is that they're censoring, don't actually process it. So, it doesn't have to do with what it is as much as it has to do with something else. And I think mm -hmm. that's another parallel with the anti-Muhammad video, mm -hmm. is that it really didn't have to do with that video there was just an excuse to protest, and it was being exploited by a number of groups. So I think that's more likely what's going on. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really have to do with Wojnarowicz, but it's kind of fascinating that they tar targeted him, of all people. I don't know if we're running out of time, but. Yeah, I think that goes, Christoph said it was like uncivilized behavior. You know, like uncivilized, it's the yeah. source of the civilization. Yes. That's the analogy to recognize these things. Just I think Salman Rushdie said something very. Um, so, oh, that's what it was. Also, that's what. Yeah, 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 that's what it was. It was uncivilized. Yeah. 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 But, but I want to make one more comment. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. This supports. It's an important story, and it's important research for you to do because I've found that sometimes with young faculty, who um, are younger than the culture wars or more privileged. Think, don't understand the importance of work that's um, pushing boundaries like this or highlighting these issues because they think, um, like, why make art about these sensational issues for the sake of sensation as if they don't understand how it's driven from a real need for you to really put, because you're experiencing the, the, the impression yourself. And so they think you make art about, about these issues to get noticed or like totally circumventing the drive and the impetus and the background and the sacrifice. And so they just see the glory and the sensationalism and the, and, the, and they think, you know, our students jump to that as if to get, that's how you succeed, get this kind of crazy success. So it's such an, it's a, such a um, out of touch perspective, but I've seen it with very otherwise sophisticated young faculty. Like, why even address art politics and just teach them to do that? And, you know, and I go, don't you? I mean, so it's, I'm saying that even very seemingly educated uh, faculty don't know of this whole arena and don't understand it and have to be informed of it, even after a really good art school education. Mm -hmm. So it's really important work. And um, I've had to educate some colleagues about culture wars and what that was about and the importance of addressing it in the classroom. And I was stunned. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that because of sometimes we're thinks that we're in the well, this is all known, but it's not. Yeah, yeah. Even among very sophisticated art spheres. Yeah. So it's a really, really important issue because that how else are we going to push against culture and and a writer? You know, a country right or wrong, if wrong will make it right. And I think we are annihilating ourselves. So, so it's, it's so so. Congratulations to you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, you guys. Thank you very much. And there's a meeting October 3rd against the forum with the, prov with the provost about uh, the, these issues of tenure. Oh. By the way, Wednesday we can play. Wait for the day if you want to, like, you know, get on the streets and. <laughs> <Mark>. <laughs> <laughs>
You can also email the president. I'm glad you came. <laughs> I could do that. Yeah, I think you're all the other writers, right? You should write mm -hmm. them. Oh, we're keen. Yes, she got it. Yeah, that's a great one. Oh, it's wonderful. Okay, it's great to see you. I'll be with you. Yeah, okay. Thank you.